Hello and good evening. My name is Ebony Bagwell and I am a physician liaison with Advanced Urology. I want to welcome you all to the presentation. Uh, today we have a urologist and a primary care provider speaking about the relationship between patients when involving prostate cancer awareness. Today we have Dr. Nicholas Farber. Dr. Farber graduated magnum cum laude from the University of Pittsburgh where he was a Chancellor Scholar. He then studied at the University of Pittsburgh School of Medicine, where he was elected to Alpha Omega Alpha, the most prestigious medical honor society. He completed his urologic surgery residency at Rutgers Robert Wood Johnson University Hospital in New Jersey and was recognized for his performance with awards, including outstanding minimally invasive surgery, men's health awards, and highest training examination score. Dr. Farber has extensive training in all aspects of urology with particular expertise in men's health, penile implant surgery, low testosterone, erectile dysfunction, Peyronie's disease, no scapula vasectomies, male infertility, vasectomy re reversals, varicocele sperm retrievals, treatment of low sperm count, and minimally invasive treatments for benign prostatic hyperplasia. Dr. Farber will be speaking today with Dr. Nick, uh, with Dr. Joshua Cutler, who is uh, with Piedmont Internal Medicine. Dr. Cutler was born in Boca Raton, Florida, and graduated Phi Beta Kappa from Emory University. He earned his medical degree from the University of Miami Miller School of Medicine and completed his internship and residency training in internal medicine at Emory University. Dr. Cutler specializes in comprehensive medical care of adults with an emphasis, an emphasis on preventative medicine, treatment of acute illness, diagnostic evaluation, and management of chronic disease. He believes living a healthy lifestyle is the most effective way to prevent chronic illness and strives to help his patients be active and form participants of their health care. So thank you both for joining us today, Dr. Farber and Dr. Cutler. Dr. Cutler will be presenting first. Thank you. So when we're talking about prostate cancer screening, we'll talk about why it's important to screen for prostate cancer, um, who should be screened for prostate cancer, how do we go about screening men for prostate cancer? Once you've actually been screened for prostate cancer, what are the next steps in terms of evaluation and treatment? And then we'll talk a little bit about the importance of the, the primary care and the urology physician relationship. So when we think about cancer in general and one's lifetime risk of getting cancer, uh, we see that in women, it's probably about 37%, maybe a little bit higher in terms of being diagnosed with cancer in one's life. And then that number is almost 50%. So basically one out of every two men will be diagnosed with cancer at some point in their life, right? That's a huge number. And when we think about the leading causes of death in the United States, um, looking back to first the 1980s, and I'll, I'll sort of draw your attention to the top two, uh, cancer was the number two cause of death in the 1980s and a distant second behind heart disease. And as we fast forward 35, 40 years, see that although cancer is still the number two cause of death, it has closed the gap significantly with heart disease, and it's not unreasonable to think that within the next coming years, cancer will overtake heart disease as the number one cause of death uh, in the US. And then getting a little bit more specific in terms of new cancer diagnoses, um, this is looking at the year 2018. Um, and in that year, there were over 856,000 new cancer diagnoses in men and of those, almost 20% of them were prostate cancer, which makes it the most common, the most commonly diagnosed cancer um, in men. And that was almost 165,000 new cancer diagnoses that year. Uh, when we look at death uh, from any cancer related death, over 323,000 people died, uh, men specifically died of cancer in 2018. And prostate cancer was responsible for over 29,000 of those deaths, or about 10%, which makes it uh, the second most common cause of death uh, related to cancer and a distant second behind lung cancer, but uh, still ahead of colon cancer, pancreatic cancer, and liver cancer. So what exactly is the prostate gland? Um, prostate gland is essentially a reproductive organ that 
um, is really not needed for life per se, but it's uh, helped to make the seminal fluid and that helps to protect the sperm. Um, in a normal individual, it's about the size of a walnut. And as you can sort of see in this picture here, uh, the prostate is located just below the bladder and then just inferior or in front of the rectum. Um, it also, if you can see, there's a tube that passes through it called the urethra, which drains uh, urine from the bladder and out through the penis. And basically, as we get older, the prostate can get bigger and it can start to compress the urethra and that makes it harder for urine to pass through. So this can cause a variety of symptoms in men, including frequency where you feel like you have to go to the bathroom more frequently during the day and also at night, waking up several times at night to urinate. Um, it can cause some difficulty initiating a, a urinary stream. Your stream might be weaker uh, than before. Um, and potentially feeling like you are unable to completely empty your bladder despite you know, trying to do so. So just to kind of recap um, the prostate cancer statistics we went over. So prostate cancer is the most common cancer in American men. It's the second leading cause of cancer death in American men after lung cancer. And when you break down the numbers, about every 18 minutes, uh, another American man is dying from prostate cancer. And this is really important, especially in the context of the COVID pandemic, because there have been people who are healthy, they're asymptomatic, and they've been putting off annual physical exams, and therefore have not had the opportunity to undergo age appropriate screening, uh, one of which could potentially be prostate cancer screening. So what are some risk factors for prostate cancer? So age is a big risk factor, and pretty much as we get older, our risk of really any cancer, but prostate cancer included, will increase. Um, African American men are at higher risk of both having prostate cancer and also at higher risk of um, developing more aggressive forms of prostate cancer. And this is probably multifactorial, um, probably a genetic component to this, probably some issues with access to care, and then other social determinants of health may be playing a role as well. And then finally, Having a family history of prostate cancer in particular is, is the big um, cancer history that we look out for. That might increase one's risk of, of developing prostate cancer themselves. But we'll also think about other forms of cancer, including colon, breast, and ovarian. And so you may be thinking, well, why should I be worried about you know, getting screened for prostate cancer if I feel well and I don't have any symptoms? And that's really exactly why we should be screened. Um, the goal of prostate cancer screening is really to try and catch prostate cancer as early as we can so that we can appropriately manage it and treat it early on. The vast majority of people never develop symptoms directly from the prostate cancer. A lot of those urinary symptoms that I was highlighting earlier, like the frequency, the retention, um, you know, the getting up at night um, to urinate, uh, those are symptoms that are generally associated with BPH or benign uh, prostate hyperplasia, but not really associated with prostate cancer itself. Now, sometimes if prostate cancer has already spread, it likes to spread to spread to the bone. So some people can present with bone pain, but at that point, you know, we're already past the point where we want to screen because we want to catch it earlier than that. So our goal again is to catch it early so that we can treat it before it's been spread. And so this is a, uh, a graph that's looking at the incidence of metastatic prostate cancer or basically prostate cancer that has spread beyond the prostate. And um, we can see that prior to the initiation of any sort of prostate cancer screening in the early, I guess, late 1980s, early 1990s, the rates of metastatic prostate cancer were quite high, uh, reaching a peak of over 70 cases per 100,000 which is very high considering that prostate cancer is the most common, commonly diagnosed uh, cancer in men. And then once we started to initiate widespread prostate cancer screening, we can see that the rates of metastatic disease as followed by this blue line, radically decreased. Um, and now it's about 25 cases or so per 100,000. And this is a really great benefit of 
of prostate cancer screening when you compare it to other forms of screening, uh, for example, breast cancer screening and, and using mammograms. Uh, prior to the use of widespread mammograms, the rates of metastatic breast cancer screening were um, about 18 per 100,000. And then even though we've started using uh, widespread mammograms for breast cancer screening throughout the 1980s and beyond, the rates of, of metastatic disease really haven't changed all that much. So this is a great aspect to prostate cancer screening is that we are able to catch early disease and limit um, essentially progressive disease, catching it early. So how do we go about screening for prostate cancer? Well, the main way, which I sort of alluded to on the previous slide, is there's a, a blood test that we can check called the PSA. And that's the primary mode of, of prostate cancer screening, but we do have another sort of tool in our, our toolbox, if you will, and that's the rectal exam. And so typically the, the process of um, prostate cancer screening is first we'll check a PSA level in the blood. And if that comes back elevated or concerning, I'll have the patient return, we'll repeat the PSA level, and we'll make sure that it's not a, a one-time or falsely elevated reading. Uh, and then I'll also perform a rectal exam at that second visit to feel the prostate. And what I'm really feeling for with the prostate is the overall size and the shape of the prostate. So does the prostate feel big overall? And if it does feel big, is it symmetric or equal on both sides? Or does it feel like there's a nodule or some irregularity that's noticeable? Um, a couple of, of notes on the rectal exam is that um, just given the anatomy of the prostate, we're really only able to feel the posterior portion of the prostate. The good thing is that most prostate cancers arise in this region, so theoretically we could potentially be able to feel uh, an abnormality that could be suggestive of prostate cancer, but obviously if it's um, if a cancer is located in some other portion of the prostate, we would not be able to feel that. And even if a cancer arises from that posterior portion of the prostate, many times they're too small to really be felt on exam. And so the more, the larger a nodule sort of feels on the prostate, that's more suggestive of either locally advanced disease or potentially disease that has spread beyond the prostate. Um, and then with regards to um, PSA levels, so the PSA, it stands for prostate specific antigen. So it, it is specific to the prostate, but it's not necessarily specific to prostate cancer, um, meaning not everyone that has a high PSA automatically has prostate cancer, right? Um, and so there's a variety of different things that can cause an elevated PSA, one of which is something that I've alluded to before, uh, the BPH, which is by far more common and causes all of the urinary symptoms. And then also just general inflammation of the prostate, like prostatitis, can, um, can elevate the PSA levels. So it's important to take all of those factors uh, into context. Um, the other thing is that in terms of the level itself, you know, we sort of think about like what number for a PSA is, is considered abnormal and, and warrants further evaluation. And historically that number was four, but it really sort of depends on the patient and, and the history. Um, it's true that the higher the PSA, it probably the more concerning it is and potentially the more likely for prostate cancer. But um, age plays an important role, and then other conditions can also play a role. So, for example, a 45-year-old man with a PSA of like 3.5, let's say, to me that's much more concerning than a patient with the same PSA of 3.5, but they're 75 years old, right? Or another, uh, you know, con contextual scenario would be someone who we've been monitoring PSA levels every year or every couple of years, and we see that their levels at baseline are low, let's say 0 0.6, 0 0.7, 0 0.8 for a few years. And then the next year you screen, it jumps up to 3.8. So that's still technically in the normal range based on this historical value, but obviously the rate of rise would be much more concerning since we already have a baseline number and we already sort of can see a trend. Um, and that newly elevated value is much different from that trend. Um, so really, essentially recapping the primary care experience in terms of prostate cancer screening, 
screening is, you know, you would come in for a visit. We check a PSA level. Um, if that is elevated, we'd have you come back and recheck the PSA level and perform a rectal exam. And then most likely at that point, I would be referring you over to Dr. Farber um, and you know, he would do some further evaluation, which might include blood work uh, or imaging or potentially biopsy to kind of further characterize that the abnormal PSA. And I will sort of pass that on to Dr. Farber now um, so we can go talk a little bit more about that. Well, thank you, Dr. Cutler. I think that was an excellent introduction uh, to prostate cancer in general. Um, you did an excellent job going over the screening. I think that was really informative, so I appreciate that. Um, I will say, just based on this slide, you can see on the left-hand side what a prostate biopsy actually looks like. And so this would be a scenario where we've evaluated things and there's either a suspicious nodule on the rectal exam or the PSA is concerning in its elevation. And a prostate biopsy is really the next step. And what this entails is it's about a 10 minute, sometimes less, five minute procedure where a probe is placed in the rectal area and then a tiny fine needle is passed into the prostate to gain prostate tissue to send to a pathologist to look for prostate cancer. Now, fortunately, most of the time we do this under um, a light anesthesia, like a twilight anesthesia. So there's no pain associated with it. Most patients wake up and they say, when are we starting? And I say, it's, it's finished. There's not much recovery to the biopsy. Uh, there's a little bit of blood in the urine for about a week, but that's it. Um, and so about a week later, you get the, an, an analysis back from the biopsy which shows whether there's cancer there or not. I'm now gonna pull up some additional slides to go over what we do if there is indeed any cancer that is diagnosed. So in terms of if the prostate biopsy itself comes back positive, then there are a couple different scenarios. And I'm gonna pull up some slides here that show what we do next. And so essentially, if you are diagnosed with prostate cancer, then the urologist, someone like me, will perform what's called a risk stratification. And essentially, we put you in one of these buckets, low risk, intermediate risk, or high risk. And the factors that go into this are your PSA level. If it's less than 10, that's low risk. If it's between 10 and 20, that's intermediate risk. And greater than 20 is considered high risk. Your score from the biopsy, and this uses something called a Gleason scale. It's an interesting scale because it's graded from six to 10. Six is considered low risk. Seven is considered intermediate risk. Eight, nine, and 10 are considered high risk. And really that's probably the most important of the three factors. And then the third one is something called the T stage. And this is performed uh, this by physical examination to determine whether it seems to be located on one or both sides of the prostate or seems to be going outside the prostate. So using these factors, we can determine whether it's low risk, intermediate, or high risk. If the prostate cancer is low risk, then oftentimes we'll do something called active surveillance where we watch the prostate cancer very closely rather than treating it. And the reason for this is after decades of research, we realized that the most low risk prostate cancer, you sometimes die with it rather than because of it. And if you watch it closely and ensure that it never changes, never gets worse, never spreads, then you may never need treatment. It doesn't mean that you won't pursue treatment if things get worse. It just means that you may avoid it if you keep a close eye on it. There's also um, intermediate and high risk patients who definitely would benefit from undergoing treatment because these are these forms of cancer are more aggressive. And I will discuss each of these in more detail. So active surveillance, as I mentioned, this is only suited for low risk patients, those with Gleason 6 disease on their biopsy or PSA less than 10, both of these factors. 
And a protocol essentially means that your PSA will be checked at least every six months, maybe every three months uh, at the beginning of the protocol. A confirmatory or confirmation biopsy is repeated within one year, usually between six and 12 months. And the purpose of this is to ensure that the initial biopsy wasn't missing any cancer that was more aggressive. So it essentially confirms that it's just Gleason 6 and that nothing has progressed. After that, biopsies are performed selectively on a case-by-case -case, uh, basis every several years. And then, of course, an annual prostate exam, if there was a nodule, um, then we're looking for any progression of that or any development of any new nodules. So what are the downsides? Well, for some patients, this entire protocol can be anxiety provoking. And so for the right patient, perhaps they should undergo treatment um, because psychologically it can be difficult to not treat a cancer, even if it is a low aggress aggressiveness cancer. And then very rarely you could miss the chance for cure being on an active surveillance protocol. Although that's extremely rare if patients come to all the follow-up visits and do all the steps of the protocol. Now for patients who are in the intermediate or high risk group, then treatment is necessary. Now we used to do a what's called an open prostatectomy. And this you can see on the left side of the screen was performed with an incision just below the belly button down to the groin area. And it was a relatively big surgery that required being in the hospital for several days and had some blood loss associated with it. The technology has improved tremendously in the past several decades. Since the early 2000s, we've been doing what's called a robotic prostatectomy. And the way this works is through several keyhole openings. You can see on the right side, the right picture, several keyhole openings in the abdomen where minimally invasive laparoscopic instruments are placed through these small openings and attached to a robot. And that robot is fully controlled by the surgeon. And the benefit of that is that it's a very quick recovery there's very little blood loss in most cases, there's less pain, and everything is done through small incisions, which often heal and sometimes are not noticeable at all. A little bit more about the procedure to remove the prostate. The surgery on average takes about three to four hours, sometimes longer, sometimes faster. The hospital stay is anywhere from zero to one days, for young, healthy, well-selected patients, if the surgery is done in the morning, they may even go home the same day. Traditionally though, most patients spend one night in the hospital and go home the next day. The surgery requires what's called a Foley catheter or a drainage uh, catheter from the bladder, which uh, is in place for about one week after the surgery. The surgery does not require much uh, medication in terms of pain meds. Most patients get by with just ibuprofen or Tylenol or co that combination. Uh, some patients do use narcotic medications for a couple days, but quickly transition over to Tylenol or Motrin. You can resume normal activities without significant restrictions in as soon as four to six weeks. The other benefit is that the prostate itself is removed, so you're removing all of the cancer within the prostate. The lymph nodes are also removed uh, around the prostate, and so if any cancer happens to have spread to the lymph nodes, then potentially it could be treated and cured at the same time as removing the prostate. Another option for intermediate and high-risk patients is something called radiation therapy. Now this is less invasive than surgery and is performed in an outpatient setting. It does, however, require many visits to receive the therapy, ranging from 25 to 45, to patient, depending on the particular patient. And it is combined with something called androgen deprivation therapy. It's a hormonal medication that suppresses testosterone levels, which you have to take for three to six months, uh, depending on the specifics of the cancer. The downside is, because the testosterone levels are low, you do experience symptoms associated with this, fatigue, sometimes hot flashes, things of that nature. 
The other downside to radiation is if the cancer does return in the prostate, surgery is very difficult. Conversely, if surgery is performed first, but cancer would return outside the prostate, it's very easy to perform radiation. And so patients who have higher risk cancers, we oftentimes recommend surgery first because you can receive both therapies. Whereas if you have a high risk cancer and you receive radiation therapy, it's very difficult to then perform a surgery. Radiation is often thought of as best suited for older patients or those who are not surgical candidates. And it can be associated with more delayed side effects such as uh, GI or bowel issues. And that's because radiation is going to the prostate but it may also affect tissues around the prostate. And so the bladder or the rectal area may receive some side effects, sometimes as late as several years later. Next, I'm gonna talk about the guidelines for PSA screening, exactly when to screen, when to not screen, and some of those nuances. So the American Cancer Society has some guidelines for PSA screening, and what they recommend is that high risk patients, so these are patients who have a family history of prostate cancer or African American race, or have a family history of conditions that may be associated with prostate cancer, such as breast cancer, ovarian cancer, pancreatic cancer. Those high risk patients should start PSA screening as early as age 45. Average risk patients, so this would be someone with no risk factors, ideally should start screening uh, with PSA test, which is a blood test. It's very simple. It's just like giving any other lab. You don't need to fast for it. And that should be uh, initiated around age 50. If the PSA is 2.5 or greater, then testing should be repeated yearly. If the PSA is less than 2.5, then it could be tested every other year. Another set of guidelines, this is the American Urologic Association. So this is essentially a guideline made by the experts in urology. And their recommendations say, do not screen men less than age 40. Reserve screening for men in the 40 to 54 uh, age range for high risk groups. That's the same group that I mentioned earlier. So a family history of prostate, breast, ovarian, or pancreatic cancer or uh, men of African-American race really should start screening in, the, in age 40. Um, and then the, the truly the greatest benefit to screening is for men age 55 to 69. And that's because you're still young, there's still um, many years left, but you're not too young that statistically there would not be prostate cancer there. And so age 55 to 69, those are the patients who would benefit most from PSA screening, prostate cancer screening. It's a shared decision making, so always discuss whether you know, to screen or not to screen. And then the AUA guidelines recommend against screening for men who are age 70 years or older if they have less than 10 to 15 years life expectancy. And so this would be someone who is older with maybe significant medical problems, who detecting prostate cancer and treating prostate cancer may cause more harm than good. But if you're a healthy 70 year old patient, then that's a different story. And there's still tremendous benefit to finding and detecting prostate cancer. And as a urologist, we, we understand when treatment is necessary or not. And so older patients who have low risk Gleason 6 prostate cancer, like I mentioned earlier, oftentimes are put on these active surveillance protocols uh, to avoid overtreatment. And then as a, as a final recommendation, the AUA recommends increasing the trigger for prostate biopsy to 10 and discontinuing PSA screening among older men age 70 to 75 if the PSA level is below three. In other words, if you're in that age range and your PSA is very low, then we can really back off in terms of when to do a biopsy and when to screen. So just to summarize that, so high risk individuals should really consider discussing screening around age 40 to 45. 
Average age patients um, really can start around age 50, and it's a shared decision making. So talk to Dr. Cutler, talk to myself, talk to your primary care doctor about the, the benefits and risks of undergoing uh, PSA screening. And really, if uh, an individual has less than 10 years of life expectancy less, uh, left, then, we, then there's no need to continue PSA screening. Additionally, we can consider stopping screening or at least scaling back screening for men greater than age 70 if their PSA is less than three. I welcome any questions that anyone may have. And I will say that, you know, just to recap, prostate cancer is the number one cause of cancer in men and the number two cause of cancer death in men. So this is very common and unfortunately may affect uh, anyone or, or anyone that we know uh, just because of how common it is. And so, you know, Dr. Cutler and my motto is we treat every patient like family because one day we may be the patient just based on the statistics. And then in terms of where we're located, I practice in Sandy Springs, in Johns Creek and Cumming, and we always strive to get patients in same day if needed. If you have an urgent issue, we'd be happy to, to, to see you and address the issue right away. All right, so thank you both for uh, the presentation. Uh, I don't see any questions at this time, so I think we can end there. Uh, again, we appreciate your time. Uh, the information is in the chat, so if you would like to make an appointment with Dr. Josh Cutler or Dr. Nicholas Barber, please feel free to call our office. We do offer same-day appointments, uh, and we take all insurances, including Ambetter and Medicare patients. Thank you so much for attending. Thank you, guys.